that I want to just remind us that this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And give God some glory, some praise, and thankfulness. For this is unlike any other day. And we're reminded that when we come into God's house, we give praise for all the times in which we fail to praise the Lord. Because something good has happened to you in the week. Something good has carried you through the week. Something good has brought you over danger and peril and toil. Something good has brought you through. And that has been God Almighty. We give the Lord some praise for that. I want to speak on the subject that no one is interested. No one is interested. Mm -hmm. And as I come to this text, you know, I'm becoming more and more convinced that the church do not even understand what Palm Sunday means mm -hmm. and what is entailed in Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is not a floral arrangement. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not just a, a ritualized form of worship. Uh, we have lost the history and the meaning behind Palm Sunday. I want to try to share with you some scenes that can help us recapture maybe what that means. There's riffraff riding across the Mount of Olives. They're making a whole lot of noise. They're so loud that they're giving me a headache. They are following the king of Riffraff, who has stirred up mess in every single town and village that he went through. He's riding on a donkey and he dares to come into the old city where the temple of God is located. Now Jerusalem has seen Riffraff before and has had disturbing things go on here. This is why we have gates. Someone should have closed them. This is why we have walls to keep from being attacked and to feel protected. These walls are supposed to guard us and protect us and keep us from harm and keep out the disturbing things of life. Sometimes these walls and gates do just that and sometimes they fail. This Jesus and his band of troublemakers are coming into our town to do what they have done in every other town, and that is to disturb the peace, break the tranquility, and disturb the order. This is a provocation. Why is he here? To question our religion again, and to question our religion even more? Why is he here? To challenge our government, and to cause trouble with the authorities? Why is he here? This is a provocation, a challenge that he's going to regret and he's going to pay for it. Meanwhile, the band of people around Jesus are shouting and dancing in joy and with an emperor's spirit. And they are tearing palm branches off of the trees and spreading garments in the path of Jesus as he on his donkey and they make their way into the city called Jerusalem. They shouted, Hosanna in the highest and glory to our king. They are shouting, the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is here. They are shouting and dancing and shouting and chanting. The people united will never be defeated. Si se puede. They dance as a demand to be heard, to be listened to. But more than that, to be understood and regarded in their cause and their needs. Make no mistake, this was a march, a protest, an action to be seen and heard, and to disturb the peace, tranquility, and the comfort of the status quo. They, 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 they picked up drunk and high people along the way. These were people who had been self-medicating without health insurance and feeling the pain of displacement and disregard as their diminishment by the culture and society felt like it was crushing them. Mm -hmm. 
They felt as if they did not belong and had been lost in a world of greed and opulence that overflowed around them. So those who had been drunk or high followed him, sobered up with mission and purpose. Then they picked up some people along the way who were lame, others who were blind, and many with physical disabilities. The priest said that these people did not belong in the temple, but they had heard Jesus, the king of riffraff, tell them that the kingdom of heaven was theirs and that the kingdom of God was in them, and so they joined in. The hungry were marching along. Those who felt what object poverty felt like joined in. As Jesus rode on his donkey, the line behind him and the people around him grew larger and the line got longer as the ranks filled with the marginalized people who had been put down, left out, cursed at, shooed away, scorned, and disregarded. There were many women joining in. They were marching. It was not a processional, but they were marching, demanding, chanting, screaming, and challenging the status quo to hear their demands and to surrender to their cause. This was a march. Meanwhile, the onlookers looked on and the Pharisees and Sadducees, the Herodians, and even some Romans were saying, this might get out of hand. A Roman citizen said, I thought the role of Jewish leadership was to keep a lid on things. It doesn't look to me like you've done that very well. And a Pharisee said to a Roman citizen, sir, we can't control every troublemaker that comes along. Don't worry about him. We will take care of him. And the Herodian soldier said, Look, there are fools and troublemakers everywhere. And let the emperor of Rome know that we have done a good job in it all. We have kept the peace and we have had, and we've grown rich in doing so. And this riffraff is not something that you should be worried about. No one is listening to him, no one is interested. No one is interested, a Pharisee flex. Look at that march and how it's growing. He's drawing people from all over, all kinds of people who are angry and upset with what we've been doing. They are mad because we have grown powerful and rich at their expense. It seems to me that they are here to demand what we have to give it to the poor, to change the government, and to make this a place where there is a God who doesn't need a priest, or bankers, or tax collectors, Uh or even the emperor's army. They are demanding the kingdom of God. That's frightening, the Romans said, and asked, do you think it's the beginning of an uprising? I don't know, they almost said in unison, but we had better watch the situation, a lone voice offered. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the crowd grew, and the electrifying nature of the gathering intensified. Jesus rode on a donkey, and more garments lined the road, and more palm branches were torn from the trees. Hoisted high in the air and laid on the road. Hosanna, blessed is the one that comes in the name of the Lord. They chanted glory in the highest they screamed. The men began to sing. The women began to dance as they walked, as they marched up. Up and down their feet carried them and their bodies swayed back and forth as if to lunge forward and then rise up and shout. This was increasing in the numbers of people and energy. And who was there? Let me see. Who was there? There were lepers, and they walked shoulder to shoulder and stepped with other people. Widows were there who had been captive by a male-oriented culture. There were people who had been told all their lives that they did not count, that they amounted to nothing, and that they would always be nothing. They joined the assembly. And the crowd of marches towards Jerusalem 
kept growing. There were people from the wrong side of town and those who had impure blood coursing through their veins and those whose skin color was darker. There were Samaritans and Jews who felt the temple and the religion was no longer theirs. And there were the revolutionaries who felt that enough was enough and it was time to do something and make things change. All of them joined together, chanting, marching, demonstrating, and advancing towards the city of Jerusalem, it appeared as if things were getting out of hand. Someone in that marching, ranting, chanting crowd said to another walking at her side, remember all the times we were hungry and begging for arms at the side of the road and we were told as people passed by, no one is interested. Another child said, yes, I remember all the times when my family needed, a doctor needed healing. And the reply was, no one is interested. And then there was another who just not, could not keep quiet. And she said, I remember all the times that we sought justice in my village to be heard, to have someone do just one small just thing. And the answer was, no one is interested. Well... This is the day, this is the time, this is the moment that all of those who were not interested will take notice and find interest. A girl, she started screaming defiantly, Hosanna, hallelujah, praise the Lord, the kingdom of God is here, the kingdom of God is near. And she started losing her voice as she declared those things more boldly and louder. Meanwhile, The onlookers looked on. They were astonished at this movement of people demanding that little people mattered. Immigrants mattered. Women mattered. Gay people mattered. Transgender people mattered. The blind and the lame mattered. Widows mattered. The poor mattered. Children mattered. Black people mattered. Brown people mattered. Those pushed down and told to be quiet mattered. These people mattered to God, and God was leading them to make it matter to the world. The voices chanted and marched. And the status quo resisted and denounced as they always do. They had denounced all along saying that no one is interested. No one is interested in you. No one is interested in your problems. No one is interested in your infirmities. No one is interested in your desires for hope and justice. The response so many times to so many of us is that no one cares. We do not matter. And seemingly the world declares that no one is interested either. No one is interested in whether you live or die. We have been told this all our lives. No one is interested in what you think and whether you think what you have encountered in life is fair or not. No one's interested. The status quo is not interested. They are not interested in whether you are a victim, whether you are homeless, whether you are hungry, or whether you are able to survive on the meager pay that you're paid. No one is really interested in your struggles, your problems, or issues. No one is interested. This is what we hear from the world so often and boldly and unfortunately it might at times seem to be true that no one really cares. No one is really all that interested. But God is. God hears. God understands your struggle. God understands your desires. God understands your need. You matter to God. And that is why God was leading his people to Jerusalem. You matter in all of your struggles to the voice and the spirit of God. You see, this is what this scene on this day that we know as Palm Sunday means. It means that God cares 
and God is interested. But Palm Sunday also says to us that the concern of God, God's interest, demands of us something more than idle prayer. Jesus leads us to Jerusalem to confront the disinterest that the society and capitalist culture has when it comes to the needs of the poor, the dispossessed, and the oppressed. God needs us this Palm Sunday to demand that our needs, our wants, our hopes, and prayers are met. Jesus is leading us to Jerusalem just like he did on that day to make a demand that the culture of indifference, the culture of apathy, the culture of hatred, the culture of fear and injustice ends right here, right now, today, with these marching feet as we march into Jerusalem and as we march into Plymouth Church. And that the dignity and worth of human beings be lifted and affirmed. Jesus is leading us to demand our worthiness in the midst of the world. Now some people say that they don't march. And I've heard other people say that they're tired of marching because no one is listening. The issue with marching, rallying, and meeting is not so much that heartless people might grow a heart, though we hope that they might grow a heart and be convicted and be converted, but that is not the purpose of a march or demonstration or rally. The purpose of such gatherings is to affirm that we are not alone, that we draw strength from one another, and to realize that we are a force to be reckoned with because we stand shoulder to shoulder with one another, and we do not stand alone. The march, the demonstration, or rally, therefore, is not a pleading or a begging to be heard and regarded, but it is a commitment to one another and a cause, and it is to recognize your strength and power in a world that says too often that you have none. Hear the disinterest of the Pharisees or the pretend disinterest of them. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, order your disciples to stop. The demand from the Pharisees is to shut up. Stop the noise. No one is interested, they're saying. You are making too much noise about nothing, they are saying. People are always reminding us as we assert our dignity and rights that we are simply an annoyance. Bombastic, unrealistic in our demands and no one is really interested after all. Tell your people to be quiet. Sit them down and shut them up. Stop disturbing everyone around us. If we had done that, blacks and women would not have the vote. If we had done that, slavery would still be a diabolical institution of the land. Segregation would still be intact if we had done that. Gay people would still be in the closet if we had done that. Children would still be laboring in factories if we had done that. Oh no, there is too much going on that needs to be challenged for us to just simply sit down and be quiet. The church has spiritualized the mission and the meaning of Palm Sunday because they want the church of Jesus Christ to sit down and be quiet. The orthodoxy of the church has dissuaded us in understanding the meaning and therefore the implications of Palm Sunday. The orthodoxy of the church and the agents of society and government has sought to make a church steeped in ritual but lacking in revolutionary passion and action. Instead of being the Palm Sunday church, the church is a church of Pharisees Mm -hmm. telling Jesus to tell his people to pipe down, Mm -hmm. act more respectable, stop disturbing the peace and 
upsetting things and upsetting the order of things. And yet, thank God, Jesus responds, if I tell them that, if I tell them to be silent, the stones would shout out. What Jesus is saying is that even the hills and the foundations of the world stand in judgment of the wrongs done to human beings. And if the people can't say it, the rocks are going to tell it. Oh, yeah. In Micah chapter 6, God brings a lawsuit against the people of the land. And if you read that closely, the hills and the foundations of the earth are to act as judge and jury. It says, rise, plead your case before the mountain. And let the hills hear your voice. Hear you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. In other words, the mountains will call out. The hills are going to tell it. And the foundation of the earth know deep in its structures why people are calling out. And if these are quiet, the creation will shout. God is leading us to call out. Jesus is leading us to declare. Jesus is leading us to declare our worth, declare our dignity, and to state our needs. And if not us, then the rocks, hills, and mountains will cry out. And the verdict, in case you're wondering, that the mountains, hills, and foundations of the earth comes back with in Micah chapter 6 is this is as you know what's required. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God. The world and the culture may act disinterested in the things of justice and humanity, but those who are following God must cry out with passion and purpose with God in their being and the urgency of God in their heart. Hosanna! Oh, yeah. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna! Glory to God. Hosanna! Our King is coming. We dare not be quiet because if we do, the rocks, the hills, the mountains, the valleys yeah. shall come.